I mean, is there a, there are concept there is a concept within Judaism that um, that the righteous always live on, right? I mean, I've always been taught from a from a Jewish perspective that the patriarch Yaakov never it, it, he never passed away. That the Torah explicitly says that uh, it's a myth. It's a legend that the righteous don't die. We can't validate that. It's a nice sentiment. And I think that if God is just, those who are evil will get what they deserve. And those who fail to see justice in this life will get a reward in the next. But in terms of anything solid, it seems that God wanted us to be preoccupied with this world and not the next, which is why the afterlife is not really mentioned, at least in the Jewish Bible. I'm not, I'm not concerned with uh, what happens afterwards. It's the process that, that frightens me the most. The process of dying? Or yes. The, 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 whatever it is that you experience exactly, um, the, the circumstances, things like that. I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have unfinished business, for example. I don't want to leave people with, I mean, from, a, from a Jewish it. perspective, this is, isn't this why we have, um, a set time allotted that we are able to mourn, that you're not technically, uh, able to be sad more than than the um, the, the than the, than the uh, well depends on I guess what midhag you file thirty days or a year but there's there's a set time right isn't that that you have to rejoice there's a set time to mourn there's a there's a there's a time and place for all things right no right well they're sitting shiva in terms of Jewish law when someone dies that's close kin you're supposed to mourn for seven some people even make it eight days. But that typically revolves around the living. There's nothing done for the dead outside of Kabbalistic circles. Even with the notion of Shmira, what's typically seen when one's a member of the Hever Kadisha, those who watch over the dead after they pass away. Yes, the Talmud mentions the practice of guarding a corpse from mice or anything that'll desecrate it. But that's it. But that's not what's done today. Again, Kabbalah hops in, and what they do today is sit together all night and constantly recite Tehillim and religious texts in front of the dead body. Why? Because mystical Judaism teaches us that when someone dies, their soul hovers over their body for three to even seven days, and that one should sit with the spirit to comfort him or her during this transition. Even the practice of saying Kaddish for the dead is not in Halakha. Who would go to shul if they didn't have to say Kaddish? Or who would continue showing up just in case someone needed to say Kaddish? Because in Kabbalistic circles, they have the notion of purgatory. And everything that's done for the dead is to get that person out of purgatory, or at least one step out of purgatory. And that's why nowadays people say Kaddish. This is why people do the whole Yiskor ceremony. But these are all new things. Oh, I it, thought purgatory was a Catholic thing. <laughs> well, if you look at where the Catholics get it from, the book they quote, at least in their Bible, is the book of, I believe, it's Second Maccabees, which is a Jewish book. Now, the Torah doesn't mention purgatory, but it is a mystical idea amongst the Jews. But it's, it's fully alive in Kabbalistic Judaism. They don't call it purgatory. They just call it Gehenna. But the understanding is that Gehenna is not a permanent place, at least for a Jew. And you suffer there for a maximum of 12 months, but you could get out earlier. And the more words of Torah or praise to God that are said in your name, it gives you what's called an alias neshama. It elevates your soul out of hell at least one step. But again, right. this isn't in the Torah nor the Talmud. This is in it's, the Zohar. It's interesting. It's interesting, though, in, from a Jewish perspective, Rabbi, and you, and, I mean, we can disagree or agree with the czar or whatever, but it's, it's interesting that Jewish people are always trying to think about how every situation be, can be used for a positive uh, for people who are alive. I mean, what, what, the way you're explaining it, like you say, it's not in the Talmud, it's not in the Torah, but even, even, that, to be the, even that to be the case, it's like, well, this – this event that takes place of a person dying, it, it's benefiting people who are alive. It's making people who who are who's living making their lives better. It's you get you get what I'm trying to say. I don't know if that made uh, sense. What I was 
it makes sense in terms of just sitting Shiva, giving people an opportunity to mourn. It's not just an opportunity. It's a mandated opportunity. I mean, you have to sit Shiva. There is a mourning period, but I think it's unhealthy when the person's death is celebrated every month, every year, and every thing you do is to bring someone out of purgatory and you have to light candles for the dead. It seems that the traditional approach was to move on, but the modern day approach is never to let go. And this is why I'm against all these Holocaust memorials, every type of memorial. It's like, we have to move on. <laughs> you know, we have to focus on the living. It seems that in Jewish law and even in Torah, defeats are never memorialized. Only victories are. Defeats are there to show you where you missed the mark so you can do better next time. But to remain a permanent victim, which is what's happened to the Jewish people, is not sanctioned anywhere in authoritative Judaism, i.e. the Torah, the Mishnah. So it seems that we are too engulfed with the dead instead of focusing on life and things that celebrate life. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. I, told, I, I agree with you. And, um, and I think some people just think that they're honoring their loved ones by recognizing an anniversary or something. But, but you're correct. At one point, I mean, especially like, you know, when you were saying this, I was thinking about every year when they do the 9-11 remembrance. And I'm like, oh, how many years will they do this every year, say every single name? Um, th at what point do we? It just let's. We have to move on. We don't forget it, but we don't like dwell in it and then wind up weeping mm -hmm. again and and then affecting our present moment. It's a sign of weakness for a society. Clearly, when they died, it, it was a tragedy. But to keep on remembering how we were caught off guard, even celebrating Pearl Harbor, you know, only weak societies do that. There's a reason why the Chinese never memorialized the rape of Nanking, what the Japanese did to what was back then the capital of China. They killed over 200,000 people, but they never memorialize it. Why? Because it's a sign of weakness in front of your enemy that you yearly cry for something they did to you. No, you celebrate victories. That's what a rational society does. And then look back and yes, I mean, you can mourn on how you weren't ready so that you will be ready in the future. But nowadays, it seems that there's people profiting off that. And it's especially like that in Judaism. They say that there's no business like Shoah business. And this is a statement in the Jewish world. Shoah is the Holocaust in Hebrew because there's so many people getting rich off this. There's all these foundations that... They get all their money to help Holocaust survivors. Everything Holocaust, Holocaust, and, and it's all nonsensical. You know, yeah, they, got like, uh, they have, uh, my understanding, I haven't visited there yet, the uh, new site there um, where they have one more trade center. But um, there's like supposed to be a gift shop there, and they're selling souvenirs. And I'm like, really? I, I hope all, uh, uh, is this money going to the victims and the families? And That's yeah, but it isn't all going to a fund. But these nonprofit organizations, stand on the fact that they do not make a profit, but they still have to pay employees and pay their CEO. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, somebody's got to run the whole show. It, it can't just be somebody standing out in a corner, passing out, you know. But yeah, I, I suppose technically true. And another reason that our attitude towards loss is so important. No other concept has affected Jews remaining Jewish like the way the Jews view the Holocaust. I mean, how many would-be Torah-keeping Jews dropped it completely because since they were little, they had this notion hammered through their skull that no matter what you do throughout history, they're still going to hate you and they're still going to want to kill you. And friends, this is not true.